Welcome to a Scrum Pulse session. My name is Leslie Morse, and you are here uh, with our panel today for a, a discussion around uh, professional coaching and the journey uh, that these folks have had as they study professional coaching. Before uh, we get going, just a couple quick announcements. Your microphones will be muted throughout this session. It is being recorded. And uh, as a participant here or as someone that registered, you'll be getting a link and availability to uh, this recording in the next day or so. We do invite you to ask questions. So down in your Zoom panel, you will see the Q&A icon with the two chat bubbles. Please feel free to go ahead and submit any questions you have there, and I'll use them as we are going through the discussion with our panelists today. Um, if you're not familiar with us, we are scrum.org. We are the home of Scrum, co-founded by or founded by the co-creator of Scrum, Ken Schwaber. And you might know us most often for our the certifications and training that we have in the marketplace, professional scrum master, professional scrum product donor, right? Our, our global group of more than 350 professional scrum trainers that are out there in the world helping advance the practice of professional scrum as we all work to solve complex problems every day. Um, but the scrum.org website has got a ton of information and resources. We work on thought leadership of what not only does it mean to do scrum professionally, but all of the adjacent things that allow us to do scrum well. So we always invite you to, uh, to come to our site and learn more. And thank you for being here today and being part of our community. Before we go too much further, I want to uh, give an opportunity for our three panelists to um, introduce themselves. We've got two PSTs with us today, as well as a friend of scrum.org. And as our, um, as our guest, I will ask you, Sheree, to just go ahead and get started with a quick intro first. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, I'm Sheree Silas. I'm a certified enterprise coach and a master certified coach with, um, with ICF. And I've been working in the agile space about 12 years and professional coaching about 10 years. And I'm excited to talk about what professional coaching is and how it can um, really marry well with agile coaching. Excellent. Thank you, Sheree, for being here. Olivier, you want to go next? Yes, thank you. So I'm Olivier Ledru from France. Um, I am a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org. And I also did an ICF professional coaching training uh, in eight years ago. So now I am both a, a trainer and a coach for people in the agile space. Excellent, thank you. And Bogdan. Last but not least, well, uh, I'm I'm actually also a professional Scrum trainer, started as developer, and sort of drifted into coaching a, a bit by bit. I've been active here with a local uh, coaching training provider, coaching center. We, we even co-piloted um, a program. I'm waiting for my, my PCC currently. That's, that's where I'm, I'm stuck, professional uh, coaching certificate from ICF. That's somewhere in the middle. And that's it. I started exploring more and more of the area and ended trying to incorporate Gestalt practices into coaching. Awesome. Well, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing and really just allow this conversation to, to flow naturally today. Thank you all again for being here. I really appreciate it. We are talking about coaching and the topic of coaching can be a little confusing sometimes, especially the more I talk to folks about it in the agile space, because um, as agilists, sometimes we use the word coaching very generically to mean agile coaching. Right, and agile coaching, almost like the word agile is a little bit of an umbrella term that contains many things, one of which is um, a coaching stance or the discipline of coaching inspired by that profession of professional coaching. So let's just open the discussion a little bit about like, what is coaching? How do the three of you define it? And I'll just sort of leave it there. Who'd like to kick that off? I would say just uh, establishing a dialogue with your client in order to help your client to reach uh, uh, her own results. Yeah. 
or maybe taking a look into negative space or, or what it's not. It's not it's not therapy and it's not mentoring. It's that in between slice where you actually are supporting the other person with their ideas, thought processes without interventionist approach. Yeah, I, I like that, Bogdan, because coaching is not a helping profession. It's a partnership profession. And so we partner with our clients um, they retain the power and the ability to make decisions and hold the agenda and decide what direction they're going to go. We're a partner with them to help them see things from multiple perspectives so that they can learn. The core principle of coaching is to create awareness so that the client can understand more so they get that change in mindset and they can make different decisions and know where they want to go um, and how to achieve what they want to achieve. Yeah, yeah. So that idea, right, all of the competencies, skills, and capabilities that allow for this thing to happen, that's what we're talking about today as we explore each of your, right, your journeys on professional coaching, right? It's called professional coaching because there really is a discipline and a set of ethics. There are several um, accrediting organizations around the profession of coaching, right? ICF, um, a few of you have already mentioned, right? Which is the International Coaching uh, Federation, right? Probably the most popular um, with their three credentials around uh, coaching, associate certified coach, professional certified coach, and then master certified coach. Uh, EMCC, also popular, the European Mentoring and Coaching Council. Um, those, are, those are the two biggest ones that we often talk about in this space. So I think it's important just to help us frame that, right, if agile coaching includes coaching, that discipline of professional coaching, teaching, mentoring, facilitating, advisory, or even sometimes consultative sort of stance, we really are just going to hone in on this coaching piece of it today. Um, so when you, what, I guess I want to hear from each of you on this, what inspired you as an agilist to consider studying professional coaching and really learning more about how to do this craft well? Um, Bogdan, let's hear from you first. Well, hey, I like talking to people, but the other thing that inspired me there is really um, I thought it's a hype, like, okay, coaching this, coaching that, coaching, coaching, coaching. So it's a bit bothering me. So I wanted to, to form an opinion on it. And also, honestly, when once I, I you know, skipped that, that threshold of trying to really understand what is it all about, then um, a way of dealing with resistance, and I say dealing because I cannot say uh, breaking it or molding it or whatever, because it's not not about breaking resistance. It's about co-creating a new path, and that that's what really made me want to to explore it more and more. And that that probably now I'm formulating my thoughts as I'm speaking. So probably the co-creational aspect that 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 Sherry mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I love that phrase, right, co-creating together, because that really is, if we think about inherently what Scrum teams and what Agile teams are doing, they are co-creating solutions to very complex and right, sometimes unknown problem spaces and in that. So to, I, I immediately see a linkage there. Um, Sheree, what about you? What inspired you to go on the professional coaching journey? Well, like many people, I was working as an Agile coach had no idea what professional coaching was. And what I was recognizing was that Agile just wasn't enough. I was working with a large airline and what they didn't need was just teach me Scrum, teach me this Agile stuff. What they needed was the ability to identify the problems that they needed to solve and how to solve them. And they needed a way to do that in a sustainable method. And so um, a friend of mine, Allison Pollard, who is, um, we worked together there. She introduced me to professional coaching and we both went on a journey to figure this stuff out. And what I found out was it was the key. It was this, it's the single most important thing that I have done that has increased my competence as a adult coach and the impact that I was able to make on clients as an adult coach. 
Yeah, I love that you talked about the word sustainability there, right? There are so many stories out there about like, you know, we were doing great on this agile thing and then all of our agile coaches left and it completely fell apart, right? You know, this idea of a coaching stance um, really puts the person you're working with in a seat of accountability, that they are the ones accountable for what their goals are and how they're going to take action. I think it builds in that sustainability and that resiliency that is so critical in agile organizations and agile teams. So thanks for highlighting that part of it, Sheree. And then Olivier, what about you? What inspired you to go yeah. on the professional coaching journey? Actually, a little bit like uh, Sherry. I mean, I use uh, the name agile coach, agile coaching without knowing what coaching is about. Uh, so before that, as a Scrum Master, I just tried to explain the rules and the elements of Scrum because I love Scrum very much. But I realized it was not so effective. People, we, people were listening to me, but nothing really changes. And actually, you can't say, I will tell you, I will explain you how you will become a self-managed team. So I, I was very much in the Scrum police stance and uh, I've tried it and it doesn't work. So I realized that I have to find another way to help people uh, to grow. Yeah, I love that scrum police. Like uh, the other phrase I hear about it um, is sort of like, ag like I'm gonna, and, and I was a professional agile teller um, <laughs> until I, I discovered coaching. And then I sort of, it's a little bit of that metaphor, um, you know, uh, teaching people to fish versus giving them a fish. Right, coaching really is helping people uncover their own ways to to yep. achieve those results. Um, so the the professional coaching journey and going to learn about professional coaching, it's not just reading a book, it's not just um, checking out some blogs or um, you know, other sorts of kind of self study. It's also not just going to a single two day class. But as an agilist, we are confronted with tons of places we could go study the idea of coaching, some of which is professional coaching, much of which is actually not professional coaching. So um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a minute just to sort of educate on some of the different schools and different places um, people might be able to learn about this. And then I'll have each of you talk a little about, you know, where did you study professional coaching and how did you learn or how did you make the choice to study where you studied? Um, so when we think about as agilists, the things that are available to us, um, there are many existing agile organizations that offer training and certification programs. Um, when we are talking about studying professional coaching, we are really looking at um, either International Coaching Federation, ICF, or EMCC, European Mentoring and Coaching Council, um, accredited coach training programs. Um, so a, a couple of the really popular ones are um, CTI and um, their program that is built around coactive coaching, CRR Global, um, and their program that's built around ORSC, which is Organization and Relationship Systems Coaching, Integral Coaching Canada, um, is also popular. Shuri is part of Tandem Coaching Academy, which has um, both um, Agile and ICF accredited uh, coach training programs. Um, so those are some of the big ones when you talk to Agile practitioners in the world that are studying professional coaching. Those are some of the common ones that we hear, but there are hundreds and hundreds to choose from. So um, which programs did each of uh, you choose? And why? Hmm. I actually, I did not choose a program. Hmm. Uh, um, I, have, I had a friend, uh, Laurent, he did a training with uh, Alain Cardon, MCC, and he said to me, you just go to Alain, Alain's training. And so I go in the training uh, with Alain Cardon without even knowing that it is an ICF accredited program. So I, I choose my trainer, actually. <laughs> Sometimes that happens with agilists as well, right? It's like, yeah. oh, I heard this person's great, so I'm going to go study with them. And then you find out there's a bunch of accreditation and certification. Behind. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Olivier. 
maybe on my side that that were that there was an interesting thing i also found a trainer and an organization here locally and they were working towards the accredited program so it was interesting being part of that <clears throat> experimentational cohort so going from approved to accredited and um, also having some more insight from from the back office so to say so that was quite quite a ride there and i went with with uh, what i mean by approved and accredited those are all icf approved slash accredited programs great thank well, you i might be the oddball out here i think i went to most of them so <laughs> i originally went to a program called coaching for clergy because i was a pastor and i wanted to learn how to integrate both work um, both, into both jobs. And I also chose that one because um, it taught in small portions and built competency over time. Later, I went to CTI. Um, then I went back to Coaching for Today's Leaders. Then I went to CRR Global. Then I went to INLP. And then I went to Business Systems Coaching. So I wanted to learn from a bunch of different people, different methods. And um, Number one thing I learned, Leslie, was like you said, competency is something that's built. It's not something that you can read in a book. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It is um, often as you think about like medical professionals who are practice medicine, right? Coaching is a profession that you practice. Um, and you're continuously always evolving and honing that craft only by doing it do you really truly hone your professionalism and deepen your proficiency in it. Um, one of our, our participants here today did ask like for us to just clarify what coactive is and what it means and what coactive coaching is. Um, Sheree, could you just do that for us sort of real quick? Yeah, basically it's just a, um, it's a statement of partnership. So we create um, the coaching relationship together. We create the space to um, learn and to grow together. Um, and so it's, it's CTI's, um, I guess, trademark term around how they define partnership. Great. And then um, when you all, when you think, if you, knowing what you know today, <laughs> if you, uh, and maybe we'll just hear from two of you on this, if you were talking to someone who is interested in beginning to study professional coaching, what recommendations or suggestions might you give them to help them choose a program that would be best for them? Um, I would say first look for one that meets your lifestyle. Um, because there are many different options. What I have found to be most effective is that you choose one that builds competency over time. You have the ability to like go learn it all in a week and that's great, but it's a lot of head knowledge and no time to build competency. So I think you do better with a program that is um, spread out over time so that you're building one skill at a time. Competency can only be built by doing it over and over and over and over and having people who know what they're doing listen and watch and give you feedback and help you to tweak things as you go along. Guys, what would you add to that? Maybe adding to that, that should be cohort based, but strong cohort connection. So I see programs that build that, you know, um, then together path towards certification with cross training with with coaching each other peer coaching things like that but maybe i would add look um test test some some coaching practices and see how they suit you because um you know if if that's what works on you probably your personality likes that so in a sense um as we mentioned, coactive, there's constructivist coaching, there's a bunch of different, let's say, flavors of it. And if you can try, see how your, your future trainer fares at coaching. If, if they are doing it the way you, you enjoy it, it's highly likely that you will enjoy the training as well and that you will find it meaningful. Yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. The, oh, Olivier, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. 
yes, I would say if you want to take it seriously, uh, as you said, it's not just reading a few books or going to a two two days class. So you should be prepared and have enough time uh, because it will be a, a huge program and, um, and you should be prepared for a, a huge change for yourself. Yeah. Not an easy race. Yeah, it's not. And what, what I'm really hearing is it's like, look for a program that not only teaches you things, but really gives you a safe place to practice and practice and yeah. practice and practice because only by doing it and practice with others, not practice just sort of by yourself. Um, yeah. But, you know, other people that are also learning. These programs can be very expensive and long though, right? I happen to study um, ORSC, Organization Relationship System Coaching. That was, you know, 15 days of training over five months and then another, what, eight or nine months of a certification program that had weekly calls and a face-to-face -face element and lots of individual work, right? All in all, it was probably you know, the better part of $10,000, if not more than that, I can't remember at this point. But you, does every Agilist need to make that investment? Or how, how, how would you know that you're, you're studying enough in this professional coaching space and all of that, because it's a lot. Actually, we have uh, to study for all our lives. So it's never ending. So you have never learned enough. <laughs> there is something to that, and especially with the idea of continuous improvement. <laughs> yeah, yes. But I actually you have also to think about okay, what is my weak point today? Should I go deeper into facilitation or mentoring or, or coaching or anything else? And obviously we will choose the path that uh, suits you the best. But you have to have a learning program in front of you. Yeah, well, I would say the fact that the programs do take a longer amount of time is actually a plus because if you're learning a little bit at a time, immediately you can start using those skills when you go back to work. And so if you're taking six months to learn, it's not like you learn everything and then you're released out into the wild and suddenly you can do this. From day one, <clears throat> you're practicing. You're starting to listen to the types of questions you ask. You're starting to shift the way you ask questions. You're learning how to listen. And so I think that's a, a good thing um, that it's taking time. And yes, programs can cost a, a decent amount of money, right? Anywhere from, you know, a few thousand dollars to up, upwards of, you know, close to $20,000. Um, what's important is that you find someone, a company that's accredited and that teach you, teaches you foundations of coaching not um, just tools and techniques. Tools and techniques are great, but if they don't teach you the basic foundations of coaching, then you just have tools and techniques and you may not be coaching, you're probably more facilitating. Yeah. I think also to that, like in most of the countries is highly unregulated area. And while, while it's not essential for, for you, it's just think about it this way. If you were in search of a coach or whatever, you would like somebody who you know is competent. While certification does not guarantee it, it's a good first indicator. So it's an umbrella term. So same way, if you are wanting to, to, to promote yourself in that coaching space, you need to have some distinct distinguishing factor there and yeah. that's precisely it training for example a lot of time investment i um often get accused of when i get into conversations about coaching with people that um yeah this all sounds really good but it's theoretical i need you to make it practical for me so as people who have invested significantly in studying professional coaching can i get a, a story from each of you about how you practically use professional coaching skills in service of building agility with the people and teams that you work with 
Sure, I, I'm happy to jump in first on that one. So if you think of agile coaching as all of these disciplines of you know, consulting, training, mentoring, and facilitation coaching, using professional coaching um, and the coaching mindset as a stance, an underlying stance of that is what's most helpful. So for me, where before I learned professional coaching and I was doing consulting, I would kind of do your typical, okay, here's all the things that are broken. That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. This is what you need to do to fix it. This, 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 and this. And what I found was people didn't like to be pushed into doing things that, you know, I'm telling them how to fix their world. And they're like, I knew what I was doing before you got here. Who do you think you are coming and telling me how to do my job? Well, when I adopted a professional coaching stance and started using coaching skills, it started to sound more like, you tell me what's happening in your organization. What are the goals you're trying to achieve? What's not working for you? Let's talk about the problems you have and how we're going to solve them. And instead of leading with all of my agile solutions, I led with their problems. And then we figured out together if there were agile solutions that they could apply. And, and while I had professional opinions, I held them more loosely instead of saying, this is what you need to do. It's not going to work unless you do this. I would say, so this is what I've seen works more in the past. What do you think about that? How do you think something like that might work in your organization? What's your sense of, is that something you want to adopt? And so they have the power to do that, which left them feeling more in control, less of a need to resist. And then, so by adding those professional coaching skills of listening and asking questions, what began to happen is instead of people feeling um, like they had to obey and getting a bunch of compliance that rolled back when I was done, they felt like they had full control and they owned the change. So when I left, things didn't roll back because they owned it from the beginning. Yes, it's all about empowerment, actually. Uh, you have, I, I, I help them to, to have their goals very clear, crystal clear. What do you want? How do you will see that you attain your goals? Describe me this uh, beautiful picture. And then they can find a path toward it. Because yeah. most of our people around us, they just want to do mm -hmm. agile. They don't, don't even know why. Yeah, this is you, you're, you're both dancing around um, topics that are in two of the questions that have come in. Um, one is around just the word coaching, and at least in the United States, how often that word is associated with the sports metaphor. Um, so there's that sports metaphor piece of it, and then there is that other metaphor or the other idea that Olivia, I think you were just touching in on here around how it's, um, people just wanna do agile. Like it's like something that they can just take on a, a USB drive, stick it in and like install it in everyone. But um, expectations of executives and expectations of managers can, and expectations of teams can all be very different in terms of how coaching serves the organization. So when you think about those, Mis misaligned or maybe not even misaligned, but those varying expectations combined with the confusion of a sports coaching metaphor, mm -hmm. how might you explain why you would use coaching and how it's different than other interventions or approaches? I know there was a lot in that question. Um, so have at it for a discussion. <laughs> Maybe just one small thing. There's nothing wrong in, in taking the sports metaphor as long as we are aware that the, that's team coaching and there's a difference between team, group, and individual coaching. Because, for example, Sherry mentioned a lot of that one-to-one that -one coaching implicitly, I would say. Correct me if I'm wrong, sorry. Uh, and that's that's okay. That's, again, you cannot just convert people to, to the true way of Agile or, or Scrum or whatever might be the case. You can only guide them towards it or even better, coach them, meaning you, you see what are the problems and what, what are you trying to resolve there. 
you should have the utmost respect for the state they are currently in because that surely served some purpose historically. So especially when you are talking about successful clients, it's not just that they, uh, you know, made the worst possible choices and they are running the multi-billion dollar business. No, it had some historical context. It had the reasoning behind it. And with all due respect, you need to help them to move further away from that onto something new. Yeah. yeah. Can can one of can I agree ever with everything Bogdan said, and I'm really longing for that short like you know how do you explain what coaching is to someone so that you can align expectations, and especially if someone might not get the sports coaching metaphor at all and how it's different than professional coaching necessarily. I don't want to explain too much what coaching is. I will try to coach as soon as possible. Mm. Because uh, when you go to the doctor, you don't expect the doctor to explain uh, what he will do. You just want him to act. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I would say that um, I explained it from the perspective of a partnership with a coach is just that it's a partnership. I don't look at you like you're broken and you need me to fix you. I look at you like you're competent. You know what decisions you need to make and you are willing to have a thinking partner with those decisions. So I'll use a wide variety of skills, coach, um, asking questions, listening, reflecting back to you, challenging your thoughts and challenging your decisions and, opin and opinions to give you a wider perspective so that you can see things um, more holistically. I will push you further to look at the whole system when thinking so that you get a bigger perspective and you can make the right decisions for where you mm. want to go. So it's not my role to tell you how to run your company. You mm. know how to do that. And you'll be doing that long after I'm gone. It's my role to be a partner with you to make sure that you um, have the courage and the knowledge and the awareness that you need to make the decisions that are going to be best for you and for your company. Mm. And it's also my role to give you the hard feedback that it's quite possible that no one else will. Yeah. And so I need your permission to do that. It um, as you're learning how to do this, it can um, I see people that are new in a professional coaching journey over occupy a coaching stance and using coaching as a one is the only way like it's like once you discover coaching coaching is the only path forward, I will use coaching for everything. So how do you discover when to use and maybe hear from, from two of you on like, how did you actually discover when to use coaching versus maybe mentorship or facilitation or something else? And that, that choosing and the discernment of when to use coaching. What was that part of your journey like? Yeah, I, I, should, uh, I like very much what Sherry says, uh, that uh, you ask for permission, first point don't coach someone without asking for permission. And on my side, uh, I, I ask my client if they, if they feel competent enough in their space. If they, are, if they say, no, we are not competent, uh, not yet. Uh, so I can go into the training stance. And if they say, okay, we are competent, we know the, the rules of the game, whatever it is. And then I check how motivated they are. Are you really motivated to go forward or it is just because someone asked you to move? So if they are not motivated enough, I can't work with them as a coach. And last point, I check also if they feel uh, uh, enough safety in the system to be coached. Yeah, there is there's a nature of safety and trust that must be present to use a coaching stance, um, as well as 
to, to choose coaching, there's something about the people being coached, being willing and agreeing to be coached. You don't coach yep. people without their explicit permission or consent to coach them. So that is one of the, the very different things. It's like, you don't have permission to teach you, please. <laughs> you, know, you know, that doesn't tend to be one of those things, but as a coach, it would be like, you know, would, would you like a coaching conversation about this? might be one of those lightweight ways that you can invite people and get their consent to sort of use that stance. Bogdan or Sheree, what about you? How did you learn the discernment of when to use the coaching stance? It was a bumpy ride. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I was guilty and I will probably be guilty of misusing the, the, the coaching stance in a sense that yes you can ask somebody but that doesn't mean that's that's the way you should go necessarily you could you know formulate the question so that somebody says yes and you're in the coaching conversation nobody wanted so uh for me i would say by experience fail forward uh try it see how it works for you or it doesn't and um, that's something that that we also discussed that people once they learn and get the new tool tend to overuse it then actually they find the spot in their toolbox of where it actually belongs. So pragmatically speaking, yes, we we all fail, we will all fail, but let's learn something from it. Shuri, anything to add to that? Yes, thank you. Um, I think really the first problem that happens is not that people over index on coaching, but they over index on two skills, asking questions and listening. And so without realizing that there's many other coaching skills there. And so you, then you get this scenario where they think they can't give any knowledge. So the client's like, here's the problem I have. How do I solve it? And the coach says, well, how do you think you should solve it? And then the client's like, can I just knock you off the chair right now because you're wasting my time, right? And so that's not actually coaching. It's using a particular coaching skill in the wrong way. And so to me, it's a matter of using, being a coach all the time. If I'm training, I'm being a coach and I'm training. If I'm mentoring, I'm being a coach and I'm mentoring. So I'm going to use all those coaching skills and I'm going to add my knowledge to it to make sure that what the client needs is what they're getting. Yeah, I am um, in a conversation with some other professionals from trainers the other week. Um, we were talking about like really good consulting, right? Solution based consulting and solution oriented consulting. Um, if you describe it can sound a lot like professional coaching. And, and I was like, I, I, I couldn't find fault in that comparison. Um, the, and we also talked about like as an agilist, right? As someone working as a change agent around agile, whether that be uh, I'm serving as a scrum master or I'm serving as a product donor, or I'm a leader in an organization that's on an agile journey, or maybe I'm called an agile coach, no matter what I'm called, I'm, I'm probably only actually really firmly in a coaching stance, maybe 20% of the time. Am I really like facilitating real coaching conversations in the structured way that ICF might be describing it? Would you all say that that's uh, for the average agilist who is bringing in professional coaching skills to the work that they do, is that sound about right to you? Yeah, I would say <clears throat> I, I'm in a coaching mindset and a coaching stance all the time and probably only doing a professional coaching conversation, structured coaching arc, maybe 10, 10 15% of the time. Okay. So even less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, but, you know, interestingly enough, what you mentioned, Leslie, there's also from the coaching community, there's more and more talk about coaching and, okay, mm -hmm. yes, there's coaching, but there's also need for other, other forms that are maybe more interventionist towards the problem or, yeah. Yeah. What, the one thing I'm hearing from all of you, though, is that because you have studied 
professional coaching, it shows up in how you work, no matter what explicit intervention or approach you might be using at the time. Right. I, I personally, as serving as a product owner at scrum.org, very rarely am actually in a structured coaching conversation, but coaching skills reflecting back to the system, holding space in a different way, the way I ask questions and engage and um, help people find their own accountability in creating solutions is all inspired from what I've studied in professional coaching, even though I'm not actually like being a coach in that moment. Um, so knowing that I think it makes the, the why and the what of coaching even fuzzier. Um, so for people that are struggling with like what this is, how does it fit into my world? Cause I'm a scrum master. Um, what might you say to them? My first idea is, is that you don't do coach, you are coach, mm. as you say. And that, I, I was going to say that that also becomes even more confusing because of the complexity in organizations that have scrum masters and agile coaches. No, I, I am not a coach. I am a scrum master. So mm. labeling it by the noun of you are a coach actually maybe contributes to some of the confusion. Yeah. I, I mean, when you, I said you are a coach, I don't mean it is your title. It's your behavior. It's, uh, it's yourself. You are respecting the people. You, you recognize that you don't know the context. You don't know what people are really reading, what they are able to do, what they are wanting to do. You are not in their spot. And so you respect their own uh, decisions, their own responsibilities. Yeah, I would, I would add that as a scrum master or a coach, one of the big things we hear people talking about is we need to have empowerment, right? We need self-organized teams. Well, using that coaching stance as a scrum master helps you to allow the team to be self-organized. So instead of bringing them solutions, you're tr making problems transparent and giving them the power to figure it out. And so um, holding that stance where they know what they do, they're doing. They don't need me to fix them and tell them how to solve their problems. They just need me to help problems become transparent and open a space for them to have the discussion. So, so I have heard every scrum master, every um, agile coach that has learned professional coaching skills, um, I've yet to hear a single one say that is not the thing that, that brought their skills over the top. And then I've also consistently heard them say it changes all of my relationships. They come back um, after going through my school and they're like, my spouse says they don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it because they like <laughs> me better now, right? <laughs> because it changes who you are as a human and the way you interact with people and the mm. way you see people. They feel respected and honored and seen and heard and intelligent. Yeah, mm. there's... Um, there's something that we don't have enough of a conversation about in the agile space um, that really deals with adult development and how we learn as adults. And it's the difference between horizontal development, the acquisition of new knowledge and skills, and then vertical development, the enhancement of how we make sense of the world, how we think, how we slow down our decision making so it can be more discerning, how we how we can be with complexity. Um, and so I think of it as applications that I'm installing in my life, right? More knowledge that I have versus my internal operating system. And there are only some apps that work on certain operating systems. So what I found as I was studying professional coaching was my own internal operating system was being upgraded. And all of a sudden these things I cognitively understood, I showed up and I could actually do them 
in a different sort of way versus only understand them. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this whole idea of professional coaching sort of percolates your own, your whole life. It is about the, the, the things that are now possible for me and those around me because I've upgraded my own operating system and the act of coaching people or the act of being coached in real structured coaching conversations also helps people with their own um, vertical development because they're uncovering their own ways. They're discovering how they make sense of the world and how they have accountability and more agency to create the outcomes that they want. And I think when we talk about, right, as, as you all have mentioned, these ideas of self-management and self-organization, it is about fully having empowerment in your own agency, not as a, just as an individual, but as a team, so that you can better solve complex problems. Yeah. Um, we're, we're starting to come up on time. So one of, um, I'll start with you, Bob's in here. What you know, People learn from mistakes and learn from those not so wonderful moments very well. So what has been one of your most challenging moments on your professional coaching journey? And what was the insight you got from that? Whew. Um, let me think for a moment. Um, well, uh, for me, actually, was... was um, I was so interested by, by the whole deal dealing with people I got into into therapeutic training and actually crossing that line that was the, what's what's coaching and what's not the coaching for me that was again probably the biggest mistake and in trying to help somebody define their goals have the 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 you know person refuse any further cooperation or anything hitting the question you know nail on the head but probably landing wrong so that's that's my personal learning and my biggest fail there so that would come back to to what you said don't overuse the tool or just because you learned a different way to ask power, power for a question like sherry said maybe it's not the reason to do it Olivier, what about you? What was one of your challenging moments where you sort of mm. stepped in it, but then you had some learning? Yes, after my training, uh, a big challenge for me was that I, I, try, I started to coach people around me and most of them were Scrum Masters. And they know that I know Scrum very well. So basically they, ask, they expect uh, some um, answers for me as consultant, let's say. And uh, so it was very challenging not to fall into this trap. And so very challenging to accept that despite my experience uh, and my expertise, I didn't know their context. I can't know, okay, are you willing to talk to this person? Uh, uh, do you think this person can help you or not? I can't know that. Uh, so I learned to be more explicit at the beginning of the coaching that, okay, even if I, I know some stuff about Scrum, I can't tell them what to do. I can't advise them because I am not in their spot. And so what I learned also is that actually it's very easier to coach someone coming from uh, another different horizon than me. It's very easier for me to coach uh, managers because they talk about stuff I don't understand a single word. Yeah, there's something I really like about that, Olivier, and that just like Scrum by itself is actually very, very simple. But the little techniques and, and, and habits and skills, ones that work in one organization may not work in another and another, or even they might work in one team and an organization and, um, you know, not in another team. So yep. just because something worked for you in the past and you did it doesn't mean it's going to work for them. So it's about like helping them uncover like what are the options um, and, and resisting that urge, right? The expert mindset, I know best, I can help them do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have a saying in French, we say, uh, you never swim twice in the same river. <laughs> you never swim twice in the same river? Yes because the river and you are always changing and the river is always changing also. Yeah. I love so, that. I love that. 
Thank you. All right, Sheree, challenge moment that, that was a um, big learning for you. Um, I think it was realizing um, that there is no arrogance in really being a coach. So I was using coaching skills. I thought I was great and I still wasn't seeing people um, as being unbroken. And I still thought of myself as above them. So I would do really not intelligent things like say, there's no project managers in Scrum. You don't belong here. You know, that you can imagine how, how effective that was. And then um, at some point I realized that I was isolating people when, when I should be helping them and partnering with them and really started to understand the shift and people are competent. All of them are competent and um, you're not better than them and you're not here to fix them. And it made a big difference when I made that shift. Yeah, yeah. There, um, and I've seen that in you you know, organizations I've worked with in the past that had hundreds of agile coaches on staff, you know, those that were studying professional coaching that suddenly got on this like, you know, elitist little tower. They were like, I'm so much better than you because, oh, you, you don't get it. Um, it, it. And it's also kind of, I think, part of the journey. Like it is your own development that you're going through, that that's a phase of it. So it's like just knowing not to sort of plateau or get stuck there that you kind of move through that portion of the journey. Um, there are you know, 14 open questions here still. I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to say that a lot of these questions and, and even things that we've gotten into today are um, really merging um, towards the discussion about how to be effective when coaching as an Agilist. Um, we've got an upcoming session on June 8th um, that's gonna be Ask a PST and get more into a lot of this. And if you've got questions in um, that you've already submitted today um, that we haven't gotten to, we will get you write-ups and we will make those available um, through a blog post or another type of resource um, on the scrum.org site. So if we haven't gotten to your question, trust me, um, we, will, we will get you information on that. Um, and I guess I'll, I will close with uh, hearing from each of you around um, just advice and guidance, right? Given what you've experienced learning about professional coaching, uh, what would you recommend or suggest to all of our viewers that are out here with us today? I love the thinking faces <laughs> that are happening right now. There's, you are witnessing, right? People slowing down in their decision-making, deciding like what would be that best suggestion or guidance and advice? Yeah, thinking fast and thinking slow, long live Kahneman. Um, <laughs> or the inner game of tennis for the others. That's both are great books, but coming to mind is, um, being humble and really trying to understand trying to get to hang to somebody you you heard as a coach they are qualified you see them as a person and trying modeling their or their behavior that's that's maybe the the lightest lightweight approach to it to understanding what it is and if you find any benefits in it in it then sure go on into much more extensive research, understanding, and training about it. Yeah. yeah, maybe try and work with one coach, maybe be the client of a coach, experience it. And so you can get an idea. Yeah. Yeah, that was going to be mine also. Um, the best way to see the power of coaching is to experience it and recognize what happens when you've got a thinking partner and you're working through um, through the conversation and learning. And um, to me, that's the best way to, to really understand the power of it. And I would say, take your time. You don't have to learn it in a weekend, you don't have to learn it in two days, um, one skill at a time um, and one thought at a time. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I, I think this this sort of leads us to a, a, a sort of a random popcorning of things. Um, there, as agilists, there are a lot of things we can go out there and read about agile coaching, right? I think about Lisa Adkins book, which is probably the most popular coaching agile teams. But again, that's everything around agile coaching. Professional coaching is just one part of that. Same thing with, you know, um, Bob Galen's new book around um, extraordinary agile coaching, right? Agile coaching as a whole, but, um, you know, professional coaching just being one part of that. Um, Shuri, in your new book, Great. It's enterprise coaching. How much of that is professional coaching versus overall agile coaching? How does that fit in there? I would say 90% of it, maybe 99% of it is professional coaching. Uh, It's not the intention of that book, Enterprise Agile Coaching, is not to teach you agile. You should know that if you're coaching. Um, The point is to teach you how to use a professional coaching stance in order to bring about sustainable change in the organization. Yeah. Two of the other books I think about are um, Michael Spade and Michelle Medor's new or newish book. Um, I think it's called Agile Transformations. It's got a lot of professional coaching stuff in it. They pull on the integral model. There's Jillian Lee and Damon Poole's book on, prof- I think it's actually called Professional Coaching for Agilists. That's not the exact name, but it's something like that. It talks very concretely about what professional coaching is. What other things would you recommend that people might go Mm. read or look at if they don't don't have that $6,000 check they can write tomorrow to go join a program, but they just want to start getting Mm. more knowledge? Where where might they get, what might they look at in reference? Uh, You have some uh, ICF YouTube channels, uh, even if different languages, so actually, I, I follow the ICF Synergy uh, French-speaking channel. And so you have a free webinar every month. And uh, some of them are just uh, coaching demonstration. So you can just watch and feel the, the energy. And some are more on some specific topics. So you can have a, a taste of it just uh, on YouTube channels. Great. Um- I made a video series for Scrum Alliance that's free and it's about 80 videos uh, around professional coaching and professional coaching um, agile organizations. It's called Path to Coaching. Um, um, It can be found at coaching, what is it? Scrum Alliance Coaching Labs, Path to Coaching Program. And then books, I would say there's one called FACTS, F-A-C-T-S, um, that based coaching, I think it's challenging coaching um, with a facts based um, model. And then there's another one called Coach the Person, Not the Problem. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, I, I would need to add one, one more book to the list. It's a bit of exotic, but I love it Fertile Void, uh, Primer on Gestalt Coaching, mm-hmm. and uh, by Leary. And one more thing. That, that we somehow skipped is just take a look at the PCC markers. So ICF PCC markers, those markers pretty much define the behavior stance and everything that should should take place. So that's, that's I, I believe, the great first reference if, if as simple as possible there. It's an yeah. Open- yeah, reading ICF coaching competencies, the ICF, um, Code of Ethics, uh, definitely very helpful. If you really just want to get that pure view on what professional coaching is, and then you can start building your own bridges to how it um, it serves us as agilists. Um, thank you, the, the three of you, uh, so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. I'm going to do a quick screen share to help us um, wrap up sort of on this theme of learning and resources. If you just go to scrum.org slash coaching, um, we've got some information about right, what is professional coaching? How does it fit in for us as agilists? As I mentioned, we've got that upcoming event on June 8th, Ask a PSTB. 
being effective in the coaching stance. And then uh, all the questions and things that came in through chat that we didn't get a chance to address, we will, I'll work with the panelists, we'll get answers to those prepared and make those available to everyone. So um, stay engaged with us, be part of the conversation. We're here to help you keep learning. Um, and learning isn't just about coaching or in the coaching space here at scrum.org. Um, Scrum Pulse sessions, we've got our blog, um, every social platform that you could think of, tons and tons of content and information available. So thank you very much for being here today. Cherie, Bogdan, Olivier, thank you so much for being um, panelists with us. I greatly appreciate it and thank you all for attending. Um, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. And bye. Bye.